Good evening. Before we start tonight's program, as always, we will address multiple sclerosis as well as other addiction and mental health uh, topics, which may be sensitive to some of our viewers. Your discretion is advised. We remind you to please consult your doctor, your mental health professional, your outreach group, your sponsor or specialist before adopting any change to your dietary, physical, and or mental health regime. If you're looking for options to go down with respect to mental health, contact SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at 1-800-662-4357. Again, that's 1-800-662-4357. The service is open 24-7, 365 days a year, and is a confidential, free information service for individuals and family members facing such stressors. Also, if you're feeling suicidal crisis or emotional distress, and need to be put in touch with a crisis center, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can also text the word HOME to 741-741. Those resources are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. One other thing. As we started talking to the last two, three weeks, we are talking about the National MS Society on every episode now. And again, the National MS Society is definitely uh, an organization that is here to help those to have demyelination and multiple sclerosis. They are a collective of passionate individuals who want to do something about MS now, to move together forward in the world free of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis stops people from moving, but the National MS Society exists to make sure that MS doesn't. To contact the National MS Society, please contact or call rather 1-800-344-4867. Again, that's 1-800-344-4867. Or go to them on their webpage at nationalmssociety.org. And on that, let's begin. Nearly three and a half months ago, when we started the venture forward, the very first thing we talked about outside of addiction was my weight, overeating, my constant battle with obesity. And I think given the events of the last five to six weeks, it's worth taking another look at that. We'll talk about how that story has changed somewhat because of the events that have taken place, but moreover, the necessity for that battle to be less than priority number one for me. We'll go over that and give you an update on what's going on with the MS, and I'll take your questions and comments. This is The Venture Forward. Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you may be, and welcome. I am John Venturini. I'm a recovering addict of overeating obesity, alcoholism, and compulsive gambling. 
And this is the Venture Forward on a Thursday night, uh, January 28th. It's a pleasure to see all of you this evening. Well, we started the show back in mid-October. We talked about addiction first and foremost, but the second thing that came out of my mouth was about overeating. Overeating has been something that has been a pain point for a good portion of my life. A battle with obesity for a very long time. And I think the sheer battle of gaining and losing and gaining and losing over my adult life, 200 plus pounds, three times, I think caught up to me. I think that it talks to exactly what I was experiencing in November and that of the second demyelination event in my life and also the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis that was confirmed off of the MRI uh, back in early January. It is something I realize that everything is interconnected. Everything has a place in how everything fits together. And when we think about the mind-body balance, we think about the things that are in our way that are preventing us from having a healthy life, that prevent us from doing the goals and the objectives that we want to do in this life, fulfilling those conquests. It all starts in the mind, but in my case, my body was living proof of that. So we're going to go back to the story of me losing 200, almost 280 pounds with about 20 to go. We'll talk about that. I'll give you an update on the MS because there have been a couple of developments in a couple of days. Uh, very interesting test that I never thought I would ever take. And I wanted to talk to that story. And we're going to try to tie the multiple sclerosis piece to the weight loss piece sometime in this hour. Uh, I'll be rest assured that we'll be talking more about this as we go forward on the venture forward. But that said, I want to say hi to the people that are joining us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Jamie, hello. How are you this evening? Hope you're doing well. And a very good afternoon to you too, Marilyn. Hope you're doing well. We started this show as basically the story about addiction and being stuck in one's mind. And the thing is, I was basically lost in my mind for a series of many different reasons, many different things. And we could try to pick that apart. We started talking about that when we started talking about co-addiction and codependency. But the ongoing effect of it is very prevalent. It's very real. And as I tell anyone, as I told you on the second episode of this show, we talk about diet, we talk about exercise, the first thing you need to think about when you go to any sort of weight loss routine or any sort of weight loss, weight loss program is trying to work through your mind. And we'll talk, revisit those slides. Quick question that came up um, that has a typo, and I'll show that too. Oh, you forgot to tell us about your MRIs that you had. Hope they went okay. And yes, the MRIs, not mom. <laughs> yeah, let me talk about that for a second. In the course of two days, I've had three MRIs. I've had an MRI of my neck, and I've had an MRI of my spinal column. And today, in Center City, I had a 7T MRI of my brain. Now, yes, I've had an MRI of my brain back on January 11th. That's what got me the MS diagnosis. This MRI is a high degree MRI. So much so that the first thing they said was, would you like a disc of it? It's right here. So I have a disc of it, but I don't have a laptop with a DVD drive on it. So I, I am getting one in the next day or so, or at least borrowing one so I can get this onto my computer so I can show you that on Tuesday. So, that said, a couple of notes about a 7T MRI. As Jamie alluded to, 
Yes, I have a DVD. And yes, my PCP will get a copy of my DVD. But um, I think uh, that in itself is something that makes you say, hmm, 2021, you have DVDs? Yeah, you do. There it is. I'll show you them on Tuesday. Um, but yeah, that was that was this morning. So the thing about the 17 machine is a high-grade magnet. It's a high-grade magnet resonance image that's going on here. The, the wonderful people at Siemens is this machine is massive. It is so, I guess, different than the MRIs I've taken over the last 10 years in the sense that when you get into the MRI, you feel vertigo or dizziness for about a minute because there's so much going on. And if that doesn't hit you, that doesn't make you squeeze the stress ball. I don't know what does, but I thought that was crazy, right? In there, it was a one hour exam, took some really good images. Apparently they're all on there. Haven't seen them yet. And, you know, when you get carted off, you get out of the machine, guess what? You have the same sensation again. So it took a little while to get used to that, but I think the information that the neurology department at Penn Medicine is getting is good. Proud to be part of the study. Proud to see what sort of insight comes from it. In addition to all that, remember the nine vials of blood I gave back a couple weeks ago? Add 11 more to the list. So there's been a lot of a lot of blood I've been giving, a lot of tests have been taken, but we're working towards something. So let's see what this all brings. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm glad to be part of something that that's helping others to have MS, and if we can get to something that is incredible. Matt, how are you tonight? My boss was scammed out of 10000 and the scammers used the money to buy an MRI machine. This was 20 years ago. No joke. This doesn't look like something that was purchased for ten grand. This was a very incredible machine. And um, yeah, but I, I'm not surprised. Matt, you have stories. Not surprised at all. Uh, Matt also says, I'm ready to go co-host another show by stop by uh, for a like. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. And Jamie says, whoa, seems frightening, but proud of you for doing it. It's a big deal. Yeah, it is. It is. It's um, it is a very much a big deal. And um, to be part of this study, which is not a large study that's being done, anything I could do to help, I'm doing it. So for sure. Uh, Matt also says there were many people scammed, not just my boss. I, I can only imagine for sure. Anyhow, let, let's talk about the weight loss journey now and in the sense that yes i i've lost nearly 280 pounds i still have about 20 30 pounds to go mind you but if this happened with the demyelination and the ms back in january 2019 i don't think i'd be in a very good place right now i've told you that on the show before i've told my doctors that and they absolutely agree with that so to be at this point right now, dealing with what I'm dealing with, instead of, say, two years ago, is a completely different game. I think my mind is in a better place to handle it. I know my diet's been a lot better to handle it. So it at least puts me on a path where I can try to fight this as much as I can, try to figure out exactly what's causing this. But moreover, see if I can also do something for the cause of trying to figure out what is the best DMT and what disease modifying treatment and what is the best cure for multiple sclerosis. We are on the forefront of science here. As I mentioned on the show, not the last show, but the show before there are 10 medications within the next 24 to 30 months that are set to come out to either be disease modifying treatments or cures or potential cures for MS. So we are on the cusp of major science here. So anyhow, one more comment before I go to some slides. How are you, sir? Um, you know, it's, um, as I've explained to many of you, this has been really cathartic for me to go through this and talk to this and be very open and forthright and transparent about what's going on. Because I also think that 
deep down inside through the recovery groups through our live streaming friends all of that this is helping you as well so anything i could do to help i'm here to help as much as you've been an incredible help to me so let's talk about weight loss so weight loss you know has been something that has been a commonplace thing that has been a part of my adult life and let's face it my childhood for 40 some odd years and the thing is I think now more than ever I am on the cusp of living a healthier life because I got rid of a lot of this I got rid of of a body that that prevented me from going to going more than five or ten feet without huffing and puffing a body that had me sweating on the coldest of winter's days because I was a mess. Not just any sort of mess, but I was basically that train that was off the rails that was not in a good place. Fortunately, now I'm in a good place. Let's talk about the story for a second. Some of this is stuff I've showed earlier on the show last season, but let's go back there for a second. If we turn back the clock to late December, early January, that was me. That was 480-pound John. That's 480-pound John enjoying a fine cigar on the left, but then also trying to get things done at work and doing conventions and thought leadership and all that stuff. That was me. And that was a person that was a very large man. But I can almost rest assured that that was a gentleman who is also a shell of the guy you're seeing right now. And it took a realization that if I continued being that person, if I continued being nearly 500 pounds, there was not going to be much left of me. Because I was on the cusp. I had a very high heart rate. My blood pressure started to go. I was pre-diabetic. I mean, I had one test that said I was pre-diabetic. I mean, it was borderline. And now, I'm in a lot better place. I have a really decent blood pressure for as many times I've taken my blood pressure in the last three weeks, all the tests. My resting glucose is decent, even though there's a family history of diabetes. But my weight's in a good place, too. You know, to be close to the to being out of the twos when I was almost in the fives. That should say everything we need to know. Anyhow. So what do I look like now outside of what you see here? That's me. That's who I am now. Someone who is a lot healthier. Is someone who has realized the things that have held them back by, by the sense of the overeating, by the obesity. By the alcoholism, by the compulsive gambling. So now you got someone who actually has a chance. And now you want to talk about a challenge in that of what I'm dealing with the MS? Bring it on. Bring it on. Because I'm in a place now where at least I could try to handle it. There aren't great days. As you've seen on the show, I'm emotionally fragile about it. There are days where I'm scared. Today, fortunately, not scared at all. I'm very thankful for that. Jamie says, thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. Marilyn says, handsome and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So that's, that's me. How much weight? Nearly 280 pounds. That little blip up over there. This guy over here, that's due to the solumedrol. Um, when I had the uh, demyelinating event, the exacerbation, um, I ended up going on a one gram drip of solumedrol for five days. That that added some weight to this. I'm mostly down from that now, which is great. And I think if you give me another six months, I probably will be down to my goal. I'm very close. This this actual chart out of lose it. Says a goal of 170. 
you can have debates on what the optimal weight is for me. I, I don't know. I think to be out of the twos is one thing. I think I feel a lot comfortable at 170. But if I end up resting at 185, that works too. But that's what it's been. You go back to January of 19, 480. 480, and by the mid, early part of February, realizing I had to do something about it, and when it started to begin, there it is. The reason why the weight loss wasn't so great, why this is not as dramatic as this, I was still drinking. I had to hit my bottom with the drinking in late May of 19 to realize, well, not only do I have an overeating problem, not only do I have an obesity problem, but I certainly have an alcohol problem. The moment I said, that's not going to serve me either, and I went down that tough road, the weight started flying off. And it's not necessarily because of the amount of empty calories there is in alcohol. It's not so much the, the sort of effect of alcohol on metabolism or whatnot. It's because one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight drinks. But I'm at a place now that I could honestly say, because of its effect on me, there is no way, no chance I could ever think of myself of a world not being sober. There's too much tied to it. And it's something that runs. And I know that I need to be very cognizant. Every day is a journey. I must never forget where I come from. That number that says 609 on the board is just as important as the number of days I'm tracking. Just as, num just as important as the number of days I haven't been gambling. That 609 is a very important number. So, is what it is. But without seeing that every day, without seeing that on my board, that's one point of inspiration I make sure I make an honest to God attestment to. As far as what I'm trying to do. 712 days of tracking food. 609 days of sobriety. 291 days not gambling. As the board says. The old Margaret Thatcher line. There is no alternative. This is where I am. I have to do this. And the thing is. Because I'm doing it. I have a chance of living a healthier life. So, got a comment coming here uh, from Jamie in the sense that she said, That's awesome. Knowing you never want to drink because of playing that tape forward. Yes. Yeah. I think of a one day in particular. I, I talked about it on the, uh, on the alcoholism episodes, but May 30th of 2019 and how much I drank that night. And all the different things I drank that night. And what happened to me afterwards. And how I didn't want to eat or drink anything for about a week. You want to talk about a bottom? That's a bottom. That's a bottom for sure. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's what we got to do. I keep on keeping on. Couldn't, put it, couldn't say it better yourself, sir. So... Why the sort of heightened sort of awareness about what weight does to me in particular? But I could rest assured, and I don't have the numbers, and but it's going to be a homework assignment for next week. How many people deal with the weight gain back, even with massive numbers? This is a graph I showed back in season one. It's a sawtooth. I lose the weight in 2002. To gain it back over time. I lose the weight again in 2011. To gain the weight back over time. You see that sort of sawtooth. And that sort of. Ever changing body type. Ever changing. Shape and consistency of organ. It's what you need to know. Is Usually you go on some sort of weight loss regime and you have some sort of plan where, okay, it's going to stay off. But for one reason or another, it came back on. But I think now, now, and this is where the new piece of the story comes in, there really is no place for it to come back. 
outside of the fact that I feel a lot healthier than I ever did, even going back to 2002. But I think there's way too much on the line now with the demyelination and the multiple sclerosis. And I'll explain that in a second. A reminder about obesity. The rate of obesity has nearly tripled since 1975. You know, 1.9 billion adults in the world have a world of 6 billion people, 18 years and older. Of that group, 650 million were obese and 1.9 billion are overweight. We are dealing with a massive problem here. And it's not a question of what is the right metric. We could talk about BMI. We could talk about modified rates. There are many different philosophies on what the right rate of figuring out one's overweight or obesity. But those are the numbers as portrayed by the World Health Organization. 39% of adults 18 and over were overweight in 2016. 13% were obese. And I'll tell you that right now. That number is definitely more now. You talk about the events of last year where people are home. They're not going out. That number is higher. You know, and the thing is, most of the world's population live in countries where overweight and obesity kills more people than those that are underweight. And this is affecting our kids too. The number I showed in season one, 38 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese in 2019. And you want to go a little further back, 340 million children and adolescents age 5 to 19 worldwide were overweight or obese. So these are numbers, these are numbers that affect so many people as far as being overweight, as far as being obese. A um, couple comments. Marilyn, uh, you're welcome for sure. I, I, it's... I, I, I do this because it's important to tell my story because this is what I have lived. And if I can help anyone, darn it, I'm going to do that. Thank you, Marilyn, for saying that. Jamie says, I blame added sugar in everything and processed foods. It's just as a start. It's so sad the obesity rates these days, but I won't get started on that. There is a tie-in to those foods and what I'm dealing with now. And um, it's very, very eye-opening, for sure. A couple more thoughts. Obesity and overall health. Uh, 2.8 million hospital stays every year in the U.S. where obesity is the cause of the contributing factor. Uh, that's uh, almost a 10-year-old statistic. I can almost rest assured that number is higher. Um, if you go back 16 years, that number of the people that are dying of obesity was 300,000 people. Every year in America, that number is probably a lot higher now, too. And if you think about the other sort of things that come to this, the other sort of disorders we have that is tied to obesity and being overweight, you're talking about heart disease, you're talking about stroke, you're talking about being uh, di uh, diabetes mellitus or type 2 diabetes, cancer, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, joint problems, and sleep apnea. Now, if we're going to draw that out one Further, what is obesity? Obesity, in a way, is a heightened sense of inflammation. What is multiple sclerosis? It is a disorder, it's an autoimmune disorder that is thriving on inflammation. So now you have a tie-in. Inflammation is common in exacerbating MS, and it's an underlying cursor to obesity. Now, we're talking about leptin and a lot of the genes and interleukin-13. It, it, it confirms that obesity is associated with the severity of relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, RRMS. That was done by a study with Dr. Mario Bassi neurologist of the Neuromed Mediterranean Neurological Institute in Italy. The results therefore suggest that excessive body weight or altered lipid profile are associated to increased central inflammation. It's real. 
it very much is real. If you talk to someone who's gained and lost 200 plus pounds and you're wondering why he's dealing with a second exacerbation of demyelination, it goes back there. Now, the reason why people don't hone in on this is that there's still a bit of sense of numbers from epidemiological science that MS does favor more towards females versus males, but they're finding that more and more males are getting MS now too. When you have that level of inflammation, it causes symptoms to worsen. In my case, everything seemed fine over the holidays, and then I started feeling the mutedness in my face and down my right-hand side, my upper jaw, hearing in my right ear is fuzzy, my handwriting's awful, short-term memory, all of that. It was basically the symptoms that I had back in 2011 to another level. This is real. This is very real. Uh, Jamie has a comment here. Um, you could be unhealthy and be skinny too. It's craziness. Yeah. There is a term that a friend of mine a long time ago said there is a... Uh, they called it being... Um, I'm not going to say it, but it's like being unhealthy skinny. I'll say it. He's called being fat skinny, but no one no one uses that term anymore. Um, yeah, it, it's only but one thing. There are a lot of things that are going on inside your body that unless you're seeing a doctor, unless you're basically, you know, getting yourself regularly checked because you're taking a health as a priority, there's no way in knowing. Jamie asks, uh, has this been my first attack since 2011? Yes and no. Technically, yes. There was a bit of a slight flare-up in 2012 when I was living in Maryland for a short period of time where they put me on pill form solumedrol, about 75 pills in a bottle over five days, and that knocked that flare-up quickly. Um, if you talk to anyone who studied you know, and Jamie, you'll know this for sure, but anyone who's studied neuroscience and neurology, the first plan of attack when someone has an MS flare-up is some sort of high-dose corticosteroid. The one I think of, the one I've talked to, is solumedrol. But yes, that is one way of kind of harboring the flare-up at, at bay. It's not guaranteed that it stops the flare-up, but at least takes care of the symptoms. Also, the reason why when you start feeling those symptoms and we know it's not anything that's outside of an MS event, they have you do MRIs, they have you do other tests to make sure they know exactly what's going on. And when they understand what it is, more times than not, they're going to put you down the road of a high corticosteroid like solumedrol. So what's one way to do this? Um, lots of fruits and vegetables. I don't know why I said loaf. Lots of fruits and vegetables. Plant-based proteins, beans and nuts, fatty fish, fresh herbs and spices. There is a diet that was prescribed for those that had MS. And I don't have a slide on this, but I'll have one for the next time we talk about it. Called the Swank Diet. The Swank Diet is a diet that is about 60 some odd years old, maybe 70. And I could be off a bit on time on that too, but it is a very old diet, but it talks to a lot of the guidance of anti-inflammatories. They also say that you should probably avoid meat in the first year of the Swank diet. So you see something like this and we talk about fruits and veggies and we talk about vegetables that are darker, darker the, the leaf color, the better you are. They talk about Fruits and the superfood qualities of fruits, so cherries, raspberries, blueberries. We talk about whole grains, we talk about beans, we talk about nuts, we talk about fish. Definitely fish. A lot of people who get tested for MS have low, low, low vitamin D levels. They also have very low vitamin B12 levels. What's the quickest way to get up to speed on D? Fish. Outside of the omega-369, fish. So that's why it's part of it. Anti-inflammatory diet thoughts. Yes. Um, I. It's not something I'm converting completely over, but it's something that I'm to almost taking a bit of an elimination approach as far as what I'm consuming. 
and making sure I stay away from things that are inflammatory. Going through that list of six, I'm definitely making sure I'm going down the right path as far as forming a diet that's a lot healthier as far as preventing the flare-up or preventing the lesions from forming or growing, all of that. It's just yet yeah, another variable I have to keep in mind when I talk about the weight loss regime, regime rather, and the routine, routine regime, right? When I talk about tracking my food for 700 plus days, I have to be cognizant of what I'm eating, not from, not only from a macronutrient sort of perspective, not only from a caloric perspective, but also the quality of what I'm eating. And if it means that my proteins have changed, then so be it. There'll be some people that tell you maybe going vegan or vegetarian is not a bad way to go either. I'm not basically endorsing that, but it's definitely something to consider. There are a couple of really good authors out there that have a lot of opinions on it. Jamie is spot on with this and Dr. Mark Hyman in the sense that it's cool to, it's cool to watch for some of the stuff. He has a lot of great bits and you know just a lot of things you can pick up on. This next one I have read. I read back in 19 as part of going down this road. And that's Eat the Beat Disease by Dr. M Dr. William Lee. It's a very important book. Um, you know, the thing is, more times than not, even those that have done it before, we forget a lot of the things that worked in the past. To read up on these sort of things and stay true to those sort of things are very important as far as trying to be successful again. Jamie continues and says, I think diets shall be tailored to each individual where, uh, where certain things that are obvious, like limit your sugars and whatnot. Yes. In my case, and again, it's I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist. Definitely see a nutritionist or a dietitian before embarking upon any program, for sure. In my case, it's 100 grams or more of protein, 40 grams or less of sugar, and 100 grams or less of net carbs. That's basically what I've been doing since January, February of 2019. And it's definitely has helped me, not only from a sense of the weight, but also just my entire makeup for sure. Um, again, I go back to the thought that if all of this happened with the MS, if all of this happened with the demyelination back in January of 19, this would not be a good place to be right now, for sure. Um, a quick plug, even though I, I'm, I'm not paid by them, it's the thing I use and I will talk to it. I use a, a, basically a program called Lose It to track my food. Uh, I track my food every day. Not only my food, but my exercise. I put notes in there about what's going on, especially when I talk about the, uh, the solubedrol and the weight gain from there. It's very important to talk about that. We talk about BMR, the basal me uh, meta uh, metabolism rate in the sense of the number of calories that you should be having in a given day. There's the Harris-Benedict equation. There's the mifflin saint jour equation. It's all based on age, based on height, uh, and based on a couple other factors, gender as well. Uh, the more that you're active, there's more of a multiplier that's added onto that. More or less, and something that's time tested over the years, 500 calorie reduction per day basically amounts to a pound per week loss, plus or minus a small bit of other factors there. It's usually about 500 and change. Lose it's the tool that I use, but there are other applications you can use as well. My fitness pal, that secret chronometer, um, my, my advice there is, as long as you're tracking, you're being honest with yourself, even if you're having a cheat day, you're at least putting yourself in a place where you can, or at least have the potential to lose weight. Sarah has a comment. Sarah, good evening. Hope you're doing well. Quality matters. Rodell has done many side-by-side -side studies of traditional versus organic agricultural ve uh, vegetables. The organics have organics have much higher nutrient values. Not surprised at all. You know, there's a reason why when you start any sort of diet and you try to maintain your health, you always shop the perimeter of the supermarket and not the aisles. You always want the uh, you always want the produce. You want your fish. You want your natural 
sort of proteins that's on the perimeter of the supermarket. You go up and down the aisles, now you have the processed stuff. And as we know, processed stuff, more times than not, is a major no-no. At least as far as m me, you know, as far as what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. And, and that, that sort of idea of the organic agriculture, the organic fruits and vegetables versus the traditional, very much so. We could talk about we could talk about uh, the production of the traditional at some point. I think that has a lot to do with it as well. So thank you for mentioning that, Sarah. Uh, let's see what we have here as well. One final note: um, there is value, and it's something I mentioned on the second episode. There is value to services such as WW, what was formerly known as Weight Watchers, Noom, etc. One method may not be the best method for any particular person. So obviously do your homework, do your due diligence, figure out what's right for you. Exercise is just as pivotal as diet. But as I have told you in the beginning of this episode, mind first, diet second, exercise third. There's a reason why we walk down that road. There was a reason why I was consuming five to 10,000 calories a day. And because there's a lot of things going on upstairs. The services mentioned or for dietary assistance, as well as many different applications and wellness providers. The communities on a, on a site like Lose It, very helpful. A lot of challenges going on all the time, but a lot of loving, caring people that are rooting each other on. When we talk about alcoholism, when we talk about drugs, when we talk about gambling, when we talk about all of it, we have strength and support in numbers. We, and to take what uh, a fine group and that of recovering addicts says we truly do recover better together to have a support net is the best thing we can have and when we don't have the energy or the guts to go to a meeting we make that meeting because meeting makers make it every single time you do not lay low from that when you don't want to go that's the meeting you should go to whether it's a question of alcoholism whether it's a question of gambling whether it's a question of overeating Meeting makers make it. It's as simple as that. Um, a couple more thoughts. Um, the value of the mind, the mind first. Journaling. I will talk about how important journaling is for me. I journal every single day. It could be a paragraph or two. It could be a response to a prompt. It could be poetry. But I journal every day. Because for me... That's something where I can get my ideas on paper. Diligence as far as that practice as well as diet and exercise can be just as important. We could talk about uh, meditation in the sense of headspace. Which I notice I did not change that from the last time we did this. It's crazy. Headspace. It's a live edit, folks. Progress, not perfection, right? Headspace, 10%, et cetera. Can help clear one's mind into a stateful, stateful place instead of stress. And then therapy. Therapy is huge. Therapists provide cognitive behavioral therapy, internal family systems, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, as they say, amongst other methods. It's an incredible asset. I am... Um, and the thing is, we must never be afraid of that. More times than not, there is something lingering up there that we should be very vocal about. And if we're not journaling about it and we're not meditating about it, we certainly need to talk to someone about it. So therapy is very important. That psychologytoday.com, a very important resource to find uh, therapists and psychiatrists in your area if you're looking to go down that road. Uh, one other point couple quotes different than the quotes I showed the first time I did this and I think it's because the things have changed a bit where I feel like these quotes are important and especially because of the things we've talked about the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking it cannot be changed without changing our thinking furthermore and sort of a corollary to that we are a product of what we manifest whether we are good, whether it's good, whether it's bad, we are capable of manifesting anything. So we're a better place if we manifest nothing but good and we think positive. We start 
being on that level where we can think positive. Not you know, not to throw a plug for her for a second, but Abraham Hicks, great inspirational speaker, was one of the lead talkers in The Secret. If you haven't seen her work or read her work, I would suggest you do. The other thought was, you never change your life until you step out of your comfort zone. Change begins at the end of your comfort zone. It's Roy T. Bennett, the author of The Light in the Heart. If the last couple of years haven't been evident of that very fact, I don't know what is. In order for us to get anywhere, we have to challenge the status quo. We have to make a change. And it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be very uncomfortable. There are going to be a lot of other things that go by the wayside because of it. But the end-all be-all is, especially when our mind's in the right place, is something that is far, far, far beyond what we've ever expected and for the better. So those are the thoughts I had with respect to what weight loss is, but also how that basically interplays with the journey now. I am um, at a place where I really feel like I have a decent handle of things, but I know there's always things I need to learn. And I love to learn. The more I learn, the better off I am. The, war the more we all learn, the more we all are better off. So for sure. Some comments. Uh Sarah says the uh, the chemical behind Roundup is a neurotoxin. Our bodies are so full of environmental endocrine disruptors, it's a wonder anyone is healthy. Yeah. It's very much a wonder why anyone is healthy, especially when there's a lot of problematic chemicals out there and the things that we take for granted. So spot on, Sarah, for sure. Amen to that, John. The meeting you don't want to go to is the meeting you need to go to. Meeting makers make it. Yep. Meeting makers make it every single time. And I'm very pleased and very blessed to have all of you watching the venture forward and being part of this community. It is, I will say it again, it is really, really important to have people like you around me that, that they're mm -hmm. watching firsthand what's going on as I'm being very transparent about what's going on, but also basically giving me a lot of love and support and care. I love and support and care for all of you too, very much so. Uh, great community here, and I'm very thankful for all of you. Uh, before we put a giant bow on it, I think I might as well talk about this once more because I want to get a dear friend of mine on the show next week who uh, is part of of an MS walk. They're doing a virtual walk this year in May. Um, and she has raised a lot of money for the National MS Society. And I would love to give her a chance to tell her story, to tell about her daughter's story as well. So I'm hoping to get her on the show either next week or the week after. In the meantime, if you want to read more about the National MS Society, you want to uh, donate to this incredible charity, one 800 344-4867. Again, 1-800-344-4867. Or you go to nationalmssociety.org. It's um, an organization that is on the forefront of trying to be on the cause or being on the, being on the cusp of a disease-modifying treatment or a cure that can help so many. So there is a lot of incredible things that come out of the MS Society for sure. Uh, Sarah says, it's a good room to be in. Sarah, you're a great person entirely. So I'm glad you're here. And I thank you for being here as, as all of you, Patty and Petey and Jamie and, and Marilyn, and all of you. You guys are great. Um, tomorrow, VF Talks, 515, 215 Pacific, where we talk about anything and everything. And um, there's a cantankerous Triceratops who thinks he's a T-Rex that usually joins in in that conversation. So I look forward to that, uh, that time on Friday afternoons where we can all just talk about anything and um, usually do. So we'll talk about that. And um, next week, we're looking to um, continue the story about the MS, but also uh, 
might spend maybe half of one more episode on the weight loss journey and where I want to go from there and also talk to uh, more of the things I think about when I try to think about the ideal weight. So there's, there's some follow up on this and we'll talk about that next week for sure. But until then, and I tell you the same thing I tell you at the end of every single venture forward, stay safe, stay sane, stay strong, stay sober. I'll see you tomorrow night at 5.15 Eastern, 2.15 Pacific for VF Talks. Have a great night.